Welcome to Basic Black. Some of you are joining us on our broadcast and others of you are joining us on our digital platforms. I'm Callie Crossley, host of Under the Radar 89.7. Tonight, public art, murals, from Roxbury and Worcester to Salem and Boston, artists of color are using murals, an ancient form of artwork, to paint directly onto walls and buildings. Recently, there's been a national resurgence of interest in this kind of public art. American modern murals, grounded in the 1980s and 90s street graffiti, created by black artists like Jean-Michel Basquiat. Today, Boston is becoming something of a mecca for local and national muralists of color. And while they welcome the opportunity to display their talents, they are concerned about how to preserve their work and how to prevent their pieces from becoming a tool to gentrify the communities where people of color live. Joining us this evening, Sylvia Lopez Chavez, muralist and artist in residence at Mass MoCA. She has also received commissions nationally and internationally. Local commissions include Seawalls Boston, MIT, Harvard, and Northeastern University. Rob Pro Black Gibbs, muralist, co founder, and director of Artist Fellowships, Artists for Humanity. And Marquise Victor, founder and executive director, Elevated Thought, the Lawrence based art and social justice organization, develops spaces for black, indigenous young people and communities to engage and understand art as a liberating power. Welcome to you all. Thank you for having us. So here's what I've learned from just uh, what you've told uh, the producers in our research, that I always thought of murals as kind of a solo enterprise. You get the wall, you get the building, and you do the work. But each of you have stressed that it really is about first grounding yourself in the community to understand how to build the piece, to understand what the area needs, all of that. So I'd like you to talk about murals as community connected. I'll start with you, Rob. Oh, that's an amazing question. <laughs> and thank you for asking. Murals connecting communities, it's a direct reflection of the people who are there. And it's our way to translate everyday operation and just a, a, an artistic form to just, if there's a person who knows where they're at, what things are going on and how they feel, some of those things can be reflected in the murals. Um, I've been recently just saying that we've all had a magic trick to just turn murals into mirrors mm -hmm. and people see themselves in it. So that's like the direct connection to how we speak visually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Sylvia, you said that you know your work has shifted over time to include this justice, this social justice element, and in doing that, that's how you got to the community-based and the interchange with the communities as you began to think about how you would paint your murals. Yeah, so I come out from the studio into the world and the street art scene, and it's through community. It's first facilitating the voices of others to try to like create these pieces, but then being able to, for me, connect to that community, whether it's my immediate community where I live and work, but also where um, the wall may be. It's so much about trying to understand that community, to connect with them, because a lot of times, if you don't, then there's this lack of ownership mm. from that space. Or in, in art, in the public realm, has such powerful way to help people connect in that form. And people see themselves, as Rob was saying earlier, in this imagery, in these murals, and being able to reflect that back and feel that they are as much part of the art as the artists who created it. Mm -hmm. I think that's very powerful, and it's important that that they feel it belongs to them and that mural actually is in this particular place and does not live anywhere else. It belongs in that space. Mm -hmm. A little bit like what French say about wine, terroir, where you are, you know, <laughs> reflects it. So Marquise, Elevated Thought, I mean, you are in the community. That's the whole point of <laughs> Elevated Thought is to, is to bring that work and, and build that, build community, really. So talk to us about the importance of murals as community reflection and community connectedness. Yeah, I mean, murals is a, is a major aspect of it. It encompasses the entirety of public art for us, you know, photo, video. Uh, but, you know, I think people of color, their histories, 
you know, we have to retroactively go back and dig and try to understand what came before us, right? So for us, public art is a way to capture these stories in the moment and also archive history, right? We're amplifying what's happening right now, uh, amplifying um, our existence and pushing forth how we want the community to evolve and progress. And that really stems from community voice because how else can progress happen in a holistic way if the people in that area aren't contributing to it. So that's kind of how we frame our public artwork. Okay, so Rob, you say that um, as a hip hop artist, you bring that to your work. What does it give you that, that history of being a hip hop artist um, as you begin to visualize what you think your mural, your particular mural should be? I would say the history that it brings is the, um, the art of storytelling and just taking the responsibility to travel into the fourth dimension, which is like things that we've known griots to do and being able to visually capture something that you've heard um, and may have been in a lyric. And sometimes what we illustrate and put onto like larger surfaces could bring that to life. There's um, a responsibility to translate that type of energy. Mm -hmm. And I think hip hop being so, you know, it's about to be 50 years old next wow. year. Mm -hmm. And my origins is the one of the disciplines, which is graffiti. So the ability to put up something large scale using a tool that's manipulated the spray can. It just has that new feel, that new fresh, like, and it's everywhere, it's international. And so like we're contributing to that international voice and platform through a culture that's recognized worldwide. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's where the superpowers lay. That's where everybody finds an ability to vocalize themselves and that ability to story tell lies deep within the culture. So Sylvia, you were a fine artist for is what we, what people would describe as such. So then you came outside to do this work. How does that background inform your style and and how you tell stories, as Rob has said? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I um, I'm not a graffiti artist. Mm -hmm. I have such respect and, and pay forward those who have paved the way for artists like me coming from you know a more um, uh, studio practice into um, a social practice, which is how I see my work during murals, where I really, you know, in the studio, you're very much doing your work in isolation in some level. And when you're out on the streets and when you're working on murals, it's a collaborative work. It's always involving others. And it's beautiful to be able to um, see the work be so much larger than what you would do on your own. And that is the power of also not only community but collaboration in in the sense of that and it influences both ways because in my sense as a fine artist i'm always thinking about the lasting effects of a piece like how can you make something so last for so many years mm -hmm. as other artists in the past have done and, and materials that you use and all these things and when you're on the street when you're on the you know, you're, you're, ex you're creating work that is a lot of times ephemeral in some extent. Mm -hmm. And so you're thinking about like that impact that we'll have in the moment, but also how it will impact people in, in, the, in various forms that at the same time, it will have a history and, it, and someone else will take over and come and bring their own voice into it as well. And being able to work with both um, the aspects of, of being working in a space where you're not only on, on your own, but also being able to bring all of those tools as an illustrator as well, which I'm trained to do so, and, and helps me really think about how do you translate small scale into large scale? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. how do you go from a small piece into being able to create something that is, you know, 60 feet high and 80 feet long wall and, and has a different experience when people are looking at the artwork and experience it at the distance, whether it's far away from a high uh, highway or um, closer. And so I think that the relationship is, is quite different. And I love, most importantly, the accessibility that allows for the art. I think that the problem I see with um, a lot of the art that is in indoors, mm -hmm. whether it's in a gallery, museum, to say access, right? And as a person yeah. of color, mm -hmm. growing up um, in a country like Dominican Republic where, you know, you have a lot of times, 
you know, it's not never like a priority. You have other priorities, and here also is, you know, you're not gonna spend um, your money yes. on a fee, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. to enter. So having access to art is super important, and this is what also has fueled my passion for being able to continue to make murals. Okay. Now, what's interesting about Elevated Thought, Marquise, is that all your whole staff is 26 years old and younger, and so you're coming to this practice, I would think, with a different, you've got the history, but you're coming differently, and you've already mentioned there are different styles that you use. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about that. How is that being expressed you know, by virtue of that you are, and it, most of your people are different generation. Yeah, yeah, the overall majority, yeah, 26 <laughs> years old and younger. Um, I think uh, a major aspect of it is creating a space where creative pathways can be a sustainable and fulfilling career. You know, you look at a place like Lawrence, um, a largely immigrant community, traditional in, in many ways, uh, where you got first generation young people that are coming up and they're creatives, but at home they're like, what, you, you trying to be an artist? Like, that, 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 that's not happening. What you, like, put that aside. Like, you could do that on the weekends type deal. But, you know, as we've grown as an organization, it's been, um, you know, especially like putting ourselves out there through our work and being like, hey, this is by you, for you, and you can be a part of this. And maybe you're not necessarily a staff, maybe you're a collaborating artist, but you know, it's been really intentional in creating these sustainable pathways for young people to come up in our program. What's next? You can be a collaborating artist. What's next? You can be a teaching artist. What's next? Now you're, you're in a leadership position in the organization, and at a young age, you're setting an example, like your, your tangible example of how creativity how creativity can go in your life if you're a young person looking at the young folks working at ET. So it's, you know, we're trying to build an ecosystem and create this understanding that, yes, this is powerful, this is necessary, and it also can, it can be leveraged for a career. Okay. Now let's talk about some of the nitty-gritty stuff, because I'm sure people listen to this conversation and say, how do you just get to do a mural? You know, you just can't walk around and just start painting on people's buildings and stuff. So there are some city-based programs. There are private commissions, as we, as we have mentioned. Um, and all of you, are in some way, have been involved in you know the whole spectrum of, of how the murals come to be, because there's obviously permissions and, and all of that. So I want to talk about the importance of having that city, that state funding, that support of artists for this kind of art, and your concern, Rob, that as gorgeous as it is, as accessible as it is, Sylvia, as powerful as it is, Marquise, so often it's temporary. And what does that mean to you? I mean, explain to me about the, the temporary anxiety you have about it as well you should. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. the temporary aspect mm -hmm. loses value. You're not being brought in at value, knowing that you have an ability to have a long lasting impact. If you're brought in temporary, you might as well work for an ad agency and do billboards. Mm -hmm. That's the chip on your shoulder that an artist would naturally probably have from that situation. But the positive side of it is that you have a short amount of time to make a big impact and change that narrative. So. There's a lot of temporary things that, that are happening traditionally that all three of us are changing that temporary to be permanent. We are showing interest in it long, lasting longer than the time given. The, the voice of the people that the work reflects raises the, the question, why is this coming down? Mm. How and where could we get more of a permanence in, in, in that type of activity? And just, you know, taking a city that's just been traditional in a lot of ways and just shaking it up a bit so we can get with the rest of the world, the rest of the nation, to have representation and, and, and a culture preserved. Because these are documents of who's in the neighborhood, who's around, how our city is just even expressed and represented, or setting a bar for when people do come in from other places to explore and share this is what you have to step to. Mm -hmm. So um, the temporary aspect should just get a lot lighter in conversation because we're proving now that we have the ability to have long lasting longevity and permanence. So I want you to speak to temporariness, um, Sylvia, and I know you've said the city ought to be funding 
this kind of art, this kind of public art, as it does sculptures. Mm -hmm. It's like if you, if, and that puts, makes you think about it in a different way, it, as you've said that. Of course, and a, a lot of it has to do with how do you plan for this? Right, and how do you think of it um, to make it be permanent? When you're thinking of materials, for example, or how do you prep a wall for that to be really well done so it actually um, stays there for a very long period of time, if that's what's desired. But I think that a lot of what Rob is saying, which I agree, is is that this idea of um, being a city, we live in a, a place where it's so historic and it preserves, and like they, it's always being given preference to old historic figures of the past in bronze sculptures, right? And and what about us that are here today? What about the contemporary nature of of reflecting who we are now and who is here now? And so um, being able to think about not only uh, prominent locations where things where people can see themselves in this space and, and making sure that the materials and the things that are being utilized are meant to be on that more permanent nature. I think it's crucial, including even uh, thinking about budgets, you know, the city budgets. Like the city has the ability and, and it's been keeping up with a lot of the artwork that has been here for sculpture so many years. So maintenance is a program that should be part of murals, should be part of any kind of budgeting um, that happens within the, the city. Don't just pay for it to go up, but exactly. pay for it to stay there. To yeah. stay there, to mm -hmm. maintain it. You mm -hmm. know, a good example is um, my first mural that I did in Boston, which is at the Charles River Esplanade, and that was uh, curated and produced right now and there, who's, who's been doing con like very much temporary works to show and help people understand the importance of having art in the sphere of the public realm. And that piece was meant to be up for one year. We were actually asked to put a coating behind the painting mm -hmm. on the wall so it could easily be like literally taken down as a wow. sticker. And people petitioned not for it not to come down. It's been in its fourth year and they've been paying for the maintenance of it. So if there's any um, peeling because of what was meant to be temporary in in nature. Now it's actually I have been going back with a team of people to actually restore it every year, and I think that's a very good testament of mm -hmm. how ready we are for having more art in the city that is there for to stay. Mm -hmm. That is not simply a nature that is temporary for whatever reason, but it actually is happening, and it's there to reflect who we are now and in a permanent level. Marquise, would you say that the preservation of these murals, which we've all established are reflections of communities, mm -hmm. is really a social justice issue? Yeah, and I think when we talk about preservation, mm -hmm. I think that, that comes in different forms. Like, I love how you mentioned the continuous care of it and the investment in that way. Um, but also, I think there's mechanisms in which to preserve it in, in, a, in an archival sense too, mm. and also to broadcast its, its presence and its purpose in different ways through community conversations, artist talks, like trips, field trips with schools there, having kids create, you know, chilling by, by a mural and, and sketching in their notebooks, being inspired by what they're seeing. So creativity begets creativity. So I think preservation is part of that process and preservation is also inextricably linked to exposure. So how do we in that process expose it to as many people as possible so that preservation exists in different forms? So the other thing you guys are really uh, concerned about, and I actually had never thought about this in relationship to murals, which is about the use of this art as a way to gentrify neighborhoods. And um, I'll just uh, read something from Ashley Gannam. She's a marketing and special events manager for the North Shore Community Development Corporation. And she says, art goes up, breweries go into the neighborhood, housing prices go up, People who live in those communities can no longer afford those. Rob, would you respond? My response is it's unfortunate when you have somebody that was probably hanging with you the whole time that you was producing the mural that lives in the building that you was painting on that can no longer live there because your work brought up the property value or the developer thought it was a nice way to put a colorful Band-Aid over actually reappointing the wall and making it sound and structure. Mm -hmm for the people that live there. Um, we need to, as artists as well, is to make sure that we're invested in just knowing the longevity, to talk about longevity and to piggyback on that, 
is to put that conversation on the table and be like, how long is this going to last and what type of space are we contributing towards? Because it's that contribution that your awareness will give you the ability to just say yes or no. Mm -hmm. And to be that conscience isn't always like the forefront because you want to be eager to get the idea out there or it's always the underlying conversation. So I feel like we just got to know what we're getting into. I think our experiences are bringing us to that point that we can start talking about what's going to actually happen in that. Mm -hmm. And from that point, we have a lot of green spaces we've been activating to the, to the, to the, to the, like, to the letter. I just know that, like, we have to be a little more forefront about what the ask is and just know that nothing good happens overnight. Mm -hmm. But that, that, that type of displacement and gentrification doesn't really um, merit the, the, the idea of putting up a mural. Sylvia, mm -hmm. so when that happens, it's out of balance. You did the work with the community mm -hmm. in the space. Right. So now it, that's completely opposite of not only the intent, but how the work then reflects what the neighborhood is, right? I agree, and I think that a lot of um, times it's unfortunate that the murals are being utilized for as a form of, of displacement, of, of making um, a, a place change so dramatically that the people who actually li have been there for a, such a long period of time have to move because they can afford it no longer. And I think that it's, you know, to me, it's, it's, as an artist, it's such a challenge because I feel public art and murals in particular have such a a strong force to make pe spaces beautiful, to make those communities proud of who they are instead of being then pushed. And so how, my question is, how can we work together to make places become more beautiful? And instead of this idea of like place making, how about place keeping? Mm. You know, what can we do to actually utilize the art, not only to bring economic and, and beautifying and making a space and people feel proud of their neighborhoods, but also bringing that balance because it doesn't need to be one or the other. I think it can be a place that conversations have to start happening where you know, developers have to like actually look at who is there and how can we actually make balance. There's such a disparity between you know, the little amount of people who make so much money all the time out of like luxury apartment buildings and, and, and displacing people that I think that there's a, a need to be able to acknowledge that we all have to be part of the conversation and that everyone needs to be able mm -hmm. to, to, con to live together in this place. And I think art can do that and can help do that, but I hate this fact that it seems to be happening more and more. And, and I think as artists, we have to become more aware of, of this need and having these conversations mm -hmm. and also bringing it to the table when we're working with, with people. I that think that's the that. point, Marquise, that uh, both um, Sylvia and Rob are making, that it has to be a public conversation now. Mm -hmm. uh, would you agree? Yeah, yeah, 100%. And I think within that process, too, there's a way to kind of educate and put into practice ways in protecting artists and protecting the community. Like what is, what are we talking about if there's a development project and what is in this contract of the ask for the production? You know, if, the, if we're in this space and there's this big development company, well how about X amount of dollars is actually going back to contribute to the housing in that space? Like there's, there's, there's more strategy and more kind of um, I don't know, grassroots organizing that goes into even what appears to be a simple simple thing like putting a mural on a building. There's mm -hmm. a lot of work I think that we can do from a community perspective um, to educate and to organize a more effective way to, to protect those spaces, to keep those spaces for the people that they're for. Okay, I want to end going up a little. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what does it feel like to work on a piece we just have a few seconds left here in the conversation, but what's it? What does it feel like to be up there doing that work? <laughs> You've asked a large and amazing question. Well, you don't have a lot of time, so. <laughs> so, in the spirit of hip hop, um, it's helped me become a visual ventriloquist. Okay. I've been able to project my voice, conversations that I have, and translate those onto pieces where, like, there's a sense of pride and legacy. 
okay. that I'm contributing towards. All right, Sylvia. It's, it's really allowing me to give voice to those who, or raise the voice of those who have been very muted. Okay, and Marquise, tell me what the response is when you're working with those young people and they see themselves and their communities on these walls. Yeah, they get to express their humanity and their experience in a way that... that I want uh, the feeling, the Marquise. Feeling, the, <laughs> no, no philosophy, just the, just the feeling. Yes. Uh, that's hard. <laughs> yeah, but, well, that's, uh, but you can uh, do it. No, 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 I'm just playing. Uh, it's, it's, pr it's pride and, and a sense of connectivity with their peers and, and that, that creates community and that creates security. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have that, you can mm -hmm. see it, you can feel it, um, a sense of empowerment, and that empowerment equals security and a foundation in which to, to enhance yourself and the community around you. Well, there you go. That's what I was looking for. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, well, I thank you. <laughs> That's the end of our broadcast and the end of our show. Thank you for joining us, and now stay with us as we continue our conversation on our digital platforms, YouTube and Facebook. Kelly Crossley, host of Under the Radar 89.7. We're on YouTube and Facebook with our post show, continuing our discussion on public art, murals. Now, something that's really interesting, a couple things. Uh, Banksy, you know, we don't know who he is. He's anonymous. And maybe some people suggest there may be many people who are Banksy. Mm -hmm. But his murals have recently been popping up in Ukraine in some serious war-torn areas. So I think about that in terms of a social justice kind of situation. It looks just like his work. If there are people who are doing it in his name, or I say his, could be her, we don't know. Um, it's pretty interesting. But there is a situation where the environment and what's going on really matches what the kind of political uh, sharpness that he's using in the murals. Um, I wonder what you all thought about that, just in war-torn areas. Who, how, how can no one see whoever's doing this? It's amazing. What do you think, Rob? I'm thinking um, the, the platform and the strategy is key, mm -hmm. and you only have a short amount of time to say something, and to be responsible with the gift is what I think the, the, the crew, as I'm going to call Banksy, yeah. is taking the responsibility on just to make sure that the timing and documenting what's happening is always going to be like, you might not be able to read, but if you see something, you know what's going on. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. And some of them are pretty powerful. Sylvia, mm -hmm. what do you think? I think this is, whether it's him or someone else, mm -hmm. so it doesn't matter because the message is being place out there and I think it's like the, the, the importance is, is what is that message and, and what kind of conversations is helping and helping make happen. Mm -hmm. And I think that that part of social justice uh, and using art as a tool for it is a very important piece because it has that ability to connect visually, you know, in any language. That's it doesn't right. matter where mm -hmm. you are around the world, the, the visual language is, is it's international and we can all connect to that and I think that using art as a form of, of expressing feelings of the people and whether it's political environmental it doesn't matter you know in this education it's, it's a really social issues can be um, be conversation starters and also push ideas out there that need to be talked about and um, to both of your points Marquise it is continuing the conversation about the devastation because they're popped up in the worst areas, mm -hmm. which is why I'm like, well, why didn't somebody see these people? But I mean, these really devastated areas where there's, some people have suggested there have been war crimes and there's four of them mm -hmm. and they're very pointed politically. Mm -hmm. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I mean, is it, is it not a testament from the history of art being inextricably linked to any form of revolution, progress, liberation, right? Mm -hmm. I, I just think that's a perfect example of it because 
art is freedom mm -hmm. at its core. Like if we can if we can take things within us and put that out there for the world to see and feel, and then we react to those feelings as well, that is a form of freedom. So every every human should have that opportunity to have that type of freedom. So to me, like it makes sense to have that dynamic, you know? And it's pretty interesting coming from him because, you know, in many ways, um, people think of him even though he does this very pointed political work as very commercial at this point, because he, you know, there was a, uh, an exhibit here in Cambridge a few months ago. It cost some ridiculous amount of money just to go in to see <laughs> the banks. Now, it was unauthorized by he, she, or the crew, as you say. Mm -hmm. But still, you know, it's interesting to see. So I guess this is the crew's way of fighting back against that, saying, you know, we there's something else going on here for us, and people are maybe doing some of these commercial things in our name. Second thing that's interesting that's going on with murals is in 1935, as you probably all know, the uh, WPA, which was the Work Progress Administration, um, put aside a great amount of money for artists in general. And this was huge because African-American artists got some money. Some of them were muralists. And in New York City specifically, it was to go, the murals were to go in the hospitals. So Harlem Hospital ended up with a number of murals, which back to the point of preservation, had been deteriorating. But in the 1990s, they finally got some money to start preserving. And it looks like it's really gotten to the point now where we'll be able to see them, and they're almost you know, done for, for in terms of the preservation. I mean, they're amazing pieces. You, have you all seen it? Do you all know about this? And what do you think about the work um, by some of those artists? I haven't seen it yet. Mm -hmm. But I feel like the investment in healing is you can show people better and you can tell them. Mm. And with something that was done before, it's celebrating that spirit of knowing what happened in the past to be able to move forward into the future in a better fashion. So that investment, just to make sure that the story's preserved and for the artists that are doing that, they're just you know, reactivating something that's very necessary and has never went anywhere. Yeah, That's the thing about it, right. it's been there. It's been there. You know. So that, that level of investment will hopefully open up to the rest of the world to be able to look at it and follow suit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Marquise? I love the, the, the process of artists of, of color contributing to that preservation. It goes back to what you said, that one of the questions you asked previously about permanence, right? And permanence kind of transcending the actual piece like that practice, that process, and like you said, Rob, the healing mm -hmm. and nature of it. Um, I think that's powerful and beautiful, and hopefully that can set up precedent for other kind of public art pieces that need that type of type of healing and, and provide opportunities for artists of color to get that practice and be part of that process that's mm -hmm. going to create that long-lasting legacy. It was interesting because I was listening at, looking at the history of it, and at the time, maybe I won't be surprised, mm -hmm. there were people saying they did not like the work that mm -hmm. they did because it was too much Negro content. That's <laughs> in quotes. Yeah. And that they were talking about issues of the community and didn't know about the folk who were issuing the money thought maybe they should be doing something else. I don't know what they thought they'd be doing. But Sylvia, what do you think about it? <laughs> Representation is so important. Mm -hmm whether it's through the imagery that is created and people can see themselves in there, but also is, is being able to provide opportunities to artists of color, you know, being able to support them in order to, to bring healing. Most of the communities that are marginalized, that are uh, in so much more need, uh, tend to be our communities. And unfortunately, art is the first thing that gets cut off from the school budgets. That's you know, true. art is the first thing, art and music and any kind of related, and so, it's backwards thinking and, and to know and to think that the country is investing, a state is investing their efforts, money, time in order to not only create, give work to the current artists working there, but also continue that preservation process throughout the years and being able to make sure that that is um, available uh, for everyone, mm -hmm. not just for a certain group that is usually the ones represented on most places. And I think, uh, you know, I did this artist residency at Boston Children's Hospital mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. some time, and my role was creating some pieces that are actually permanent to display there, but I also got to make art with, with artists, and part of that residency was funded through a research study on how 
are it heals. And they are the approach of this holistic approach to healing where engaging in the creation of art and, and actually not only observing the art but also experience it through art making can actually increase oxygen levels, can actually lower your blood pressure, can you see tangible um, results on the process of art making or being exposed to art. So I think we all need it. Mm -hmm. And um, our lives, just by the color of our skin, the texture of our hair, sometimes it's so stressful. Just to be out on the street is stressful. Yes. And to be able to provide healing through art is so powerful. And I think we need more of it in every community. Well, I can say we've, on this show, we've done um, conversations about the studies, and there are many. Um, documenting what is called PTSD mm. in some communities of color. That's how strenuous and stressful it is. I couldn't draw my way out of this chair, but <laughs> I, <laughs> I really do love public art. Love, I love art in general, but public art is really something to be able to just walk by it and look at it or sit and just admire it and watch all the other stuff. So I know for certain, just anecdotally, you know, what that kind of healing process is for me. And then to have that be reflected by those of you who are reflecting me, well, that's a whole other, that's a whole other place. I mean, it really takes you to a different place. So if you put that together and know that there's documentation of PTSD in communities of color, and here you all are supporting and making art in those communities, of course, there has to be some relief of stress, and it's very important. Do you think we're at the point now, I feel it changing some, but I could be in some little bubble, that there is an appreciation of public art in a way that just wasn't there even a few years ago, that I feel like that's happening. You're saying yes. Oh, Sylvia. yes, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And personally, I feel like I have experienced that COVID has brought up a lot of this um, attention Good to point. public art. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As a muralist, I have felt it. Mm -hmm. I, I have been having way, like my workload has increased dramatically after COVID started. And I think that there's an appreciation because when you think about how the world shut down, we are confined to our spaces, very tiny, and like the only thing that has helped us through is art, is music, is books, is movies, films is the art that is out in the public. You cannot access any indoor spaces, so what's left out that can actually be accessed in the public realm? And so I think that people have a better understanding and acknowledgement of this and an appreciation for um, not only the need to have more of it, but also how important it is on a daily life for our mental health, for our physical health also, and I think for sure, I've seen um, in the last few years an increase on that and, and hopefully continues to be more of. So there's more funding and there's more programming and there's more involvement from not only um, the civic, in, you know, the people mm -hmm. in the group, but also the leadership and being right. able to both at the public level, civic level, and also at the um, private sector and corporations, include like investing more on this kind of um, needed, very necessary art form. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Marquise? You know, I, I, I think, um, I just want to amplify your point about like some of the tension. Um, I think there, we're, we're heavily invested in trends, right? And mm -hmm. so a, a big question is how do we make this moment long lasting and mm -hmm. not just the trends and- A moment to a movement. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And educating point. people and supporting people so they're like leveraging these opportunities right now to build pathways to what's next because mm -hmm. You know, you can't, you can't, we're about, we're, we may hit a recession, right? Yeah. People ain't gonna be spending money on murals, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So like how, how to- Unless they understand that it's necessary. Right, right, yeah. right, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. But exactly, so mm -hmm. where are we getting the, mm -hmm. where, where's that money coming from to, mm -hmm. to make that art? And how are we taking those creations and, and creating other aspects of the work that might not be a public work, but it's a, it's a kind of appendage to it that we're able to continue. I, I think, 
there's a lot of strategy right now with the moment. I love what you said, the moment to a movement, right? Mm -hmm. With the momentum that's happening right now, how can we really operationalize this mm -hmm. and make it a long lasting like ecosystem of creatives, especially mm -hmm. in the public sphere, especially for artists of color. So I think again, like being on this panel with these folks right here, I think, you know, the, the next point is like, we, we're gonna link up, we're gonna continue the conversation, All we're right. gonna build, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's what we need mm -hmm. to do. Right. We mm -hmm. can't just be, we can't be complacent and, and we celebrate it, appreciate it, but hey, let's build for what's next because we need to do that. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Rob? Yeah, to, to support what everybody's saying, the work never stops. When we leave this conversation, I'm always going to be like, I see you at work. Mm -hmm. There's been a time when um, we have to talk about the vocabulary around this and define ourselves as the resources. We talk about resources, we're thinking in another capacity. We are a resource. Mm -hmm. I spoke to over like 14 schools since the pandemic and the, and the activation of these murals. And I'm just proud to say that like, at a moment when everybody was probably looking down, walking around, worried about the next person, they looked at anything we've created and their head was up. Mm -hmm. It was a physical act that just, yeah. something that was simple to activate people to do. And now we're at the point where we can tell that journey, talk these stories, put the education and the art in a way that like you got, I've had probably over five or four young people that told me their artistic career started from stuff that we've all been a part of. Wow. And it's gonna be ongoing and ongoing. So to, you know, calling ourselves as resources and starting to change that language, mm -hmm. that's my thought. We're gonna speak about it different. We're gonna walk and I'm gonna see my brothers and sisters at work. Well, that's a perfect place to end this conversation. Mm -hmm. I thank you all for joining me. Mm -hmm. thank, <laughs> you. thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. That's great. Well.